So we're going to talk about a very controversial and widely debated subject today, vaccination and epilepsy. I'm going to try and answer the questions. Does vaccination trigger epilepsy? And should you vaccinate an epileptic dog? This is a hotly debated subject and there's an awful lot of hype on the internet, but I'm go going to try to give you the results of a study that I have done and also objectively look at the evidence so that you're uh, in a better position to make an informed decision about your pet. So a common question that I'm asked as a veterinary neurologist who sees a lot of epileptic dogs is could the vaccination have caused the epilepsy and should I vaccinate my epileptic dog? And of course, these are legitimate questions because caregivers of epileptic um, dogs search um, a lot after the diagnosis of epilepsy of what could have caused the seizures, what could be triggering the seizures. In most cases, this isn't a question that can be answered, but it doesn't stop, stop people wondering. And if they do a Google search, does vaccination cause epilepsy in dogs? They'll certainly reveal a minefield of mostly anecdotes that are not even direct experience, just people saying, well, I've heard this X and Y, and certainly amplified in the retelling. And caregivers just want the best for their dogs. And so the aim of this uh, this uh, uh, YouTube video is really my efforts as a specialist in epilepsy to try to balance the hype with the evidence so that caregivers and vets can make an informed choice. And I should balance that out by saying as a specialist vet, I don't vaccinate. I don't buy vaccines. I don't sell vaccines. I make no profit from vaccination apart from not seeing the consequences of the diseases that we vaccinate against. So parvovirus and distemper and uh, leptospira, um, the death that this results in, and in, certainly in the case of, of distemper, the permanent disability and um, uh, that neurodisability that the, that disease can result in. So first of all, how common are adverse reactions from vaccines? And I was quite actually surprised when I was reading this paper, uh, which is cited down the bottom here, that there's so much difference between countries. And in the UK, where I'm based, it's down at about 0.001%, which I think reflects my own experience when I was in general practice. It wasn't something that you saw very commonly. And when you did see it, it was it was really quite a minor kind of injection site reaction, which is like a tenderness and pain at the injection site. And it, in contrast, it's very much more common in Japan, which makes me wonder what's different between the vaccines uh, in these two countries. Um, most of these vaccine reactions in Japan were within f five minutes, which means they're very likely to be uh, anaphylaxis. Um, and going along with that, you tend to have gastrointestinal and dermatological signs of so swellings in the skins and, and vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and then most of them were within 12 hours, which, again, is what you would expect with an, an acute reaction to a, a vaccine. Uh, and this worked out at, at about 0.63 percent, um, so much, much higher than the UK. And in the USA as well, I was quite surprised um, that it was at 0.38 percent. Again, uh, the majority of these in the same day. And in both Japan and the USA, they found that some breeds were more predisposed. Um, Dachshunds and Chihuahuas uh, being a common theme there. But Pugs, Boston Terriers, Toy Poodles and Miniature Schnauzers also kind of overrepresented, which makes you think there may be some genetic predisposition to there. And in the States in particular, they found that smaller dogs getting multiple vaccines were more predisposed. So what adverse reactions were reported? Well, a vaccine reaction, which is sort of like a tenderness at the vaccine site, which lasts a few days. Anaphylaxis, which I talked about before, which occurs within minutes. There is a link to autoimmune disease. Um, the one in the literature is immune mediated hemolytic anemia. But as a neurologist, I've seen some animals present with polyarthritis or steroid responsive meningitis arteritis following uh, vaccination or had their disease reactivated after vaccination. Although that, it should be said that's rare. And actually a study in uh, steroid responsive meningitis didn't find that. 
Um, there are a uh, sort of strain of Weimaraners that are pr predisposed to a jaw disease called hypertrophic osteodystrophy after vaccination. And in cats, so there's uh, this YouTube video is on dogs and in, in cats, there is a risk of injection site sarcoma. You have to balance this out by saying, is there an underreporting here? There well could be because vets have to fill out a form for a vaccine reaction. And well, sadly, you know, this takes time and, and a busy vet schedule. And so it may be that the, 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 the numbers that we have are less common, and though it should be said in this particular study here, um, in this uh, USA study in particular, went through the medical records. And so um, it wasn't a case of looking through the reported records. It was the medical records, uh, which is a good deal more accurate because it will be reported there if a, if, a, if a caregiver reports something to a vet. So this is a common study, as I say, for, for epileptic dogs. So I decided to do a study um, and this is the results of that study, which I is actually 20 years old now. And I presented it to um, BSAVA Congress. That's the British Small Animal Veterinary Association Congress. Um, and like uh, um, quite a few studies that I've done, I, I've never have had time to um, to write it up properly and get it uh, published. Uh, so it is. this is not uh, peer reviewed, um, just uh, to make that clear. So what I did was that I was a sole neurologist in a busy London practice at that time, the Stone Lion Veterinary Clinic in Wimbledon uh, near the tennis. Um, and I looked at my hospital records, these are my own personal hospital records for all of the cases that I saw over a four year period with a diagnosis of epilepsy. So all of these cases have been examined, had a history taken and were treated by me. Um, and I know that I always would verify the, the date of the last vaccination if I could by asking the owner. And I also would check the medical records which had been sent to me by the, uh, the local the local vets referring the cases, they would always send their full medical history. And I included the dogs if they had uh, a diagnosis of epilepsy, so not just a single seizure. So it's two or more generalized seizures. They had to have a normal neurological exam. Um, and uh, if they were aged in the age range for uh, an idiopathic epilepsy, then they either had to have no MRI um, and a normal neurological exam or a normal uh, MRI scan. And if they were out with those ages, they could only be included if they had a normal brain MRI scan. So that's because out with those ages, they're much less likely to have idiopathic epilepsy and more likely to have a structural cause of their epilepsy. I also excluded dogs that didn't have uh, more than two seizures. I didn't have good follow up for them. And obviously, if they had structural disease on a brain MRI. And, and as I was investigating whether vaccination uh, made uh, caused epilepsy in predisposed dogs. I did actually include a couple of dogs that had uh, other things. There are three dogs with a normal neurological exam and normal MRI, but they had a history of head trauma and two dogs that had marked disparity in ventricular size. Um, this is a finding of equivocal significance, uh, meaning it's not been proven to be associated with epilepsy, but it's quite common. And that's an example there as an epileptic pug and one very, very big ventricle and one not so big ventricle. So how many dogs did I have? So over four years, I, I treated 123 epileptic dogs and I had to exclude 31 because uh, at the time of the first seizure, the vaccination wasn't recorded. So that gave me uh, 92 dogs and I divided them into six groups according to the length of time between the first seizure and the vaccination. And I also looked at the age that the first seizure was recorded. And I also looked at all of the records that I had. I went through absolutely every single uh, bit of history on those dogs to look for any history of seizures associated with vaccination. So not just the first seizure starting after vaccination, but any connection between seizures and their vaccination. So here are my results. Um, the uh, first uh, sort of uh, results was with the the time for the first seizure after vaccination you can see them distributed there I guess I was my question was is how many dogs had it within three months of vaccination because certainly at the time in the early 2000s people a lot of people were saying you're more likely to get a seizure within three months of, of, of the vaccination so I was looking at specifically and there were 24 dogs uh, and four of those were within uh, two weeks 
and that's the spread there. So you can actually see the majority of them uh, are actually nine to 12 months uh, after vaccination, which is no coincidence because this is the sort of peak age that idiopathic epilepsy starts. If you assume that they um, uh, have um, have had their vaccination from eight weeks to, to, to 16 weeks, most dogs start with idiopathic epilepsy at about a year to, to 18 months. So um, this wasn't a surprise, but is it statistically significant? Um, so first of all, the question is a dog more likely to develop epilepsy within three months of vaccination. So the theoretical time of, of seizure um, onset within each time range is 20 percent. So we can we can go back and and look at that. So we've got 26 percent, 20, 14, 30 and more than uh, 12 is nine months. Um, but it's not um, we can't really make any conclusions without that without doing the stats. So here are the stats for those that want to to look at those. And I will just state that, that this is not significantly different. There was no significant difference between any of those timelines. Um, and in fact, um, if you um, even looked at the dogs that had four within two weeks, that was not statistically significantly different between having seizures two weeks before your next vaccination. So in conclusion, the onset of seizures are actually well distributed in time and not related to vaccination and did not occur mo mostly within three months of vaccination. But I was looking at the uh, other questions. So out of the 123 records, all of the dogs, three owners reported that they'd had one to two seizures occurred within one to two days um, of the booster vaccination on repeated occasions. And one of those three owners reported that seizures repeatedly occurred after any veterinary visit. In fact, in that dog's records, I can remember it quite well. Um, the vet said, please examine this dog in the car park. He will have a seizure if he comes into the veterinary quest uh, building. So it has to uh, give the question, is, is, it the, is it the veterinary visit, which is uh, the emotional arousal and stress associated with that, which is more likely to result in the seizures? Or is it is it um, uh, vaccination? There was one dog that had a very bad seizure cluster four days after vaccination, and two dogs had their second second seizure event within a week of booster vaccination. Now, going back to what I said before, that really could just be chance, given that the seizures were evenly distributed in the last study. Um, so uh, my conclusion was that they don't support an association between vaccination and the start of epilepsy. However, there's maybe a small number of dogs that do appear to have seizures associated with vaccination. Is this chance, stress of a veterinary visit or perhaps the immunological effects of vaccination? So in answer to the question, should you booster vaccinate an, epi an epileptic dog? And of course, this is this is my opinion. Um, well, I follow the WSAVA guidelines. That's what I would refer to people because these are people with a lot more uh, um, uh, knowledge about immunology and vaccinology uh, than, than I do. So that's what I go to. And those have been recently updated. My results do not uh, indicate a significantly higher risk for epileptic animals. So I would uh, uh, suggest that you assess on a individual basis. And if the caregiver is particularly concerned, then measure an antibody titer to establish if they are protected or not against those diseases. And what do the WSAVA guidelines say? Well, you should really read them, but gen um, uh, they say that with the core vaccines, which is parvo, distemper and uh, adenovirus, um, you should vaccinate for six weeks and, and they should have a vaccination every three um, to four weeks until 16 weeks. Um, that may continue if you're a very at-risk area. And from 16 weeks, only a, then a single modified live vaccine will protect most dogs. However, manufacturers recommend two. And I have to put a little aside here. I'm not sure why it is, and perhaps somebody can put an, an answer in the comments for me, why it is if dogs miss a vaccine, even by a few months, that we vets recommend that they do the whole course again. That doesn't make immunological sense to me at all. Is it just because that's what the manufacturers recommend? Um, so, but um, since the manufacturers recommend it, most people will start that course 
again, if they don't know the, the dog's vaccination status. The booster vaccination is normally given between 12 and 16 months. Actually, the WSAVA, you know, quite correctly, say you should consider this at six months. The reason why you have two vaccines, by the way, is because the dog has an amount of immunity from its mother. And if you vaccinate the dog when that uh, maternal immunity is high, it won't be protected because that maternal immunity will will block it. And so you have to repeatedly vaccine because you do not know in an individual dog how much maternal antibody they have and how fast it's dropping. And there's a small chance that when you vaccinate at 16 weeks or wherever the protocol is, that that dog won't be protected. And so there's actually an argument for giving it one single vaccine at six months rather than a booster vaccine when it's much uh, leaving it a whole year. But again, that's, um, that, that goes against what's normal policy. And then the WSAVA recommend that uh, the next vaccine being at three years old and thereafter no more frequently, no more frequently than every three years. Leptospira is a different matter. Um, and I have to say I've seen more uh, vaccine reactions from Leptospira than with the core vaccines. Um, but that's not many. Um, that's only a handful. Uh, puppies from eight weeks, two doses, two weeks, two to four weeks apart. So if you combine that with that, then it means um, uh, you're going to give two doses, two to four weeks apart. And then dogs from 16 weeks again, which goes back to um, to that bit. And then the booster is annually rabies vaccine. It depends on your local laws. I hope that has uh, been some uh, interest to those that were wanting uh, an answer to this question. Thank you very much.